location at a verbal home, there's someone. Okay, so we're going to start off our meeting now. Um, welcome back, everybody. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving with friends and family and some well-deserved rest. Uh, we're a few, three weeks, I think, until Christmas time. Like, yeah, three weeks. It's, it's going by really fast. So I hope everyone is staying warm and healthy. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Gio, Giovanna V. Doli and Dr. Cadence Hollenbach as our guest speakers. Um, Dr. Vidoli is a research associate professor and associate director at the Forensic Anthropology Center, and Dr. Hollenbach is an associate professor and associate curator of Pale paleontology botany at the McClellan Museum and of Natural History and Culture. So um, I hope everyone was able to participate in the polls um, in, the, in the tribute today. Um, Fun fact, when I was looking up the trivia questions, um, I saw that less than 1% of people are AB negative, and I'm one of those people. Um, so that's why I thought it was really interesting. <laughs> I was like, oh, I didn't realize our blood was actually um, so rare. Um, it made sense now because my mom told me um, when I was younger, so I grew up in Gainesville, Florida, so right next to UF, and they would actually ask, um, volunteers if they could provide a little bit of their um, blood donations to to do some research so a little fun fact about me and tie it into science um virtual science club so um let's start off our meeting okay again today is november 29th 2022 so <clears throat> for those who are new here um virtual science club um meets every other tuesdays on twice twice a month, uh, we have breakout sessions with our um, uh, graduate mentors and then uh, guest speakers. Grades from six to twelve um, do come through. Uh, some teachers and leaders are um, always welcome to come, and it's free to attend. Um, if you'd like to register for our next meeting, um, which is going to be December sixth, that's going to be with our mentors. Uh, you can check the uh, QR code on the website there. Um, and then you'll be registered for the next meeting. Um, <clears throat> for the next meeting, we do have our mentors, like I said, and um, the categories are human resources, or excuse me, <laughs> human sciences, <laughs> natural sciences, physical science, and engineering and math. All right, SACEF is also open uh, for registration now. Um, if you need your product to be pre-approved, the deadline is January um, 18th. Project registration is February 28th, and then the actual competition is gonna be March 28th. Uh, for full details on the registration process, you can go ahead and click on, or take a picture of the uh, SACEF website QR code and the registration info and timeline on the screen. Again, um, these are the counties that we do serve for the um, for SACEF. Um, if you are not located in any of our counties, please go ahead and talk to your uh, teacher to contact us and see if there's any way we can get you connected to another local uh, science fair that you can compete in. All right, so now we're going to go turn to our guest speakers, Dr. Bodoli and Dr. Hollenbach. Do you have access and everything? Perfect. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and yeah, just one second, um, start the slideshow. Okay, so you all can see our slideshow here, right? Great, okay. So thank you so much for having us. Um, we're excited to uh, tell you all a bit about anthropology, at least the parts of anthropology that we, uh, that Dr. Vidoli and I are active in. So anthropology is the study of humans, 
Uh, if you break down the word there, um, anthropos means human and uh, that uh, uh, root term in Latin and ology or logos for study. So uh, the study of humans, study of humanity. And we look at that very broadly. Um, anthropology is uh, often divided into four sub-disciplines. The first one is cultural or social anthropology. So looking at um, the diversity of humans across the earth, especially today. So across space, looking at diversity of folks. Uh, linguistics, looking at languages and how that reflects our social and cultural interactions and backgrounds. Biological anthropology, so looking at, you know, us as biological creatures and how we then interface with our environments and again with each other. And then archaeology, and that's really looking at the human experience through time, so around the world as well as through time. So we look, again, um, we study humans um, through time and space. I am an archaeologist, and so that's my area of research, and Giovanna is a biological anthropologist, and so we'll both talk about uh, what we do, uh, a little bit about what we don't do, um, possibly, uh, and then some of the research that we're working on. But first, we wanted to tell you kind of how we got into this, especially for um, you younger students who um, might be interested in, in looking into a career like this. Um, so how I got into archaeology, when I was in eighth grade, um, that's usually when you do some of your state history courses. Um, so I, I was living in Colorado at the time, and the first chapter of the book, I think the first page of the book, talked about the Monte Verde cliff dweller, uh, the cliff dwellers out there, uh, Mesa Verde cliff dwellers, um, and the archaeologists who found, who stumbled upon those and uh, studied them. And I was like, what? Archaeologists? That's a thing? That's like a real career that people can look at the history of folks way back in time like that? And it really kind of blew my mind away. And so uh, I was very interested then in going on and doing that uh, in college, but I was a little bit worried too about, um, about being able to find a job in archeology. span So I double majored in environmental science. I really like science as well. Uh, and so um, to the degree that I, uh, archeology span allowed me to do a bit of history, but also kind of work in some science I was really excited by. But when I was in, um, in an undergraduate um, school for my archaeology major, we had to have a field school, an archaeological field school. And so I was lucky enough to go to a field school in Alabama at a site called Dust Cave um, that had evidence of occupation. You can see this stacked up layers of occupation here in this photo. That white, whitish material is ash from fires. That red material is hardened clay where they were making these like hearths, um, cooking surfaces, and any of the really dark black materials are going to be charcoal. So just stacked up about uh, 7,000 years of occupation in there. Super exciting, super fun. Uh, and we collected some really great materials. We had excellent preservation of plant remains and bone that went back 12,000, 13,000 years. Uh, so we collected all of these really small materials. I also got to do a lot of really fun outdoor things like fix generators and drive boats and, and big trucks and things like that. It was a ton of fun, uh, a lot more fun than sitting in a lab for the most part. And I uh, got to study plant remains. And so this was such an exciting way to be outside and kind of part of that environmental science in, in real life. Um, but also, again, this way to combine science, my science interests, with my interest in history, that I was hooked from there. Um, and I'll let Dr. Vidoli talk about how she uh, got into bio bioarchaeology. Thanks. And also thanks again for um, the invitation to be here. This is um, exciting. So I, in seventh grade, so Candy had her first sort of exposure to archaeology in seventh, in eighth grade, mine was similar in seventh grade, we were um, asked to write a paper, and I don't remember for what class, maybe it was a history class, and I had been hearing about <clears throat> Mount Vesuvius, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, in 79 AD and the city of Pompeii and other cities around that with the eruption, <clears throat> sorry, of Vesuvius, the town got covered with ash and then it was basically a time capsule. Time stopped there at that moment of eruption. 
um, for, you know, for a very, very long time. And I was like, well, I, I want to write about this. But what really intrigued me was the cover of National, Geogra of, of National Geographic magazine. Andy, you'll have to hit oh, that one. Yes, and <laughs> I don't like And yeah. uh, <laughs> And that was a magazine that used to, I don't know if it's still in print, um, but my parents used to get it. And I saw this magazine cover of, um, you know, some of the skeletal remains found at Pompeii. And that's what started my interest, you know, both archaeology and in bioarchaeology of what were the last moments, especially in this context, of the people in Pompeii and then just expanded like what were the last moments of people um, and then when I was in high school I read a newspaper article about somebody's grave who had to be like a historical figure whose grave was exhumed to see if um, if it was that person and that was the first time I saw the term forensic anthropologist um, and that was in high school and then I went and uh, received my degree in anthropology, my bachelor's degree, uh, like Candy, did a field school, an archaeological field school, spent some years working outside, which was fantastic. Um, really get to see a lot of uh, the surface of the country, but also beneath the surface, which is pretty neat. Um, and now I am lucky that I have, you know, that I'm working for UT at the Forensic Anthropology Center where I am able to combine, you know, my desire to understand what happened to people, um, you know, as, as they died, um, with also working with archaeologists. So that's my, my journey. Okay. Oops. Uh, another reason why I liked archaeology is kind of the puzzle of it. You know, we and you tend to think of artifacts and how we put them back together as some of the puzzles that we do. But even more fun and exciting is trying to piece together the our evidence that we have to figure out how people lived in the past. So we might have uh, get some idea from sites about the types of houses and structures that they lived in. Um, some of the artifacts, like here's this is a nutting stone. I know it's a little blurry. A nutting stone and um, nuts. We do get remains of nuts um, that people um, left behind. Uh, the, back here, um, evidence of a fire, the fire pits and um, hearths that they used. Um, yeah, this is a turkey. Again, hard to see. It's blurry. Um, but some of the animal bones, so we can see what people were hunting. Um, uh, we do know that they had dogs and children. So how do we pull all of this little, these different pieces of evidence together to kind of develop this really much richer picture of how people were uh, lived in the past? So I'll tell you then a bit about um, some of the things that we look at then as archaeologists to try to pull these um, different pieces of the picture together. Um, we're looking basically at what is left behind, and that's often what people throw away. We don't often have those Pompeii moments uh, where you have everything sealed off. It's usually people abandon a, vi a village, um, you know, their fields um, uh, are, are no longer productive and they have to switch their, their farm area to a new more productive area or they get pushed out by um, other people coming in. There are many reasons why people leave, right? They hunt out an area, so they need to move to a new area where hunting is better. We get what's left over. And sometimes they leave a lot and sometimes they don't. If, you know, if you think of like a hunting camp where they're just coming really briefly and staying for just a few nights or maybe a week, we're not gonna find a whole lot left over. If they're living at a site year round or for years and years, like at Pompeii, we have a ton of stuff left over. So um, we're just, we're, we are stuck with what's left behind. So for the time periods, my specialty, my area of research is here in the Eastern US. Uh, we don't have a lot of stone architecture and things like that. So what we're looking for is the decay of some of this material in the ground and the stain that it leaves behind with that organic material decaying over time. So these posts and some of these structures that, um, that they built, we have these stains that are left over. And this is what it looks like. This is a site in North Carolina, dates around 500 years ago. These dark stains, each of these was a post for a house. Uh, and these darker, larger ones would have been storage pits that then they filled back in with trash afterwards, after they um, um, pulled all the materials out of them that they needed. Um, so those are the kinds of stains that we're looking for and we uh, try to piece them out. Another um, cooking feature 
Again, a lot of charcoal in there and other artifacts that we pull out. This is a really large storage pit. This is actually from the Townsend site here in East Tennessee, just down the road in Blount County. Uh, and what this really large pits look like after they've been dug out completely. So obviously they stored a whole lot of something in there, probably a whole lot of nuts. Uh, and again, kind of piecing these together. Here's another example of, uh, of a structure, but this is a kind of a causeway, a door, tunnel, entryway, and the storage pits around it. So you can kind of start piecing together how people use this space too, right? There's a dark stain in the middle where they've probably had a fire. These smaller posts here in the middle, probably a bench around the outside that they use for sitting and sleeping on, storage underneath. So we'll probably find a lot of little trash that gets swept underneath and not a whole lot in this area where they're walking all the time and don't want to step on things and you know cut their feet and stuff like that. So you can again kind of start looking for things and, and piecing that all together. And we also map out all of these into really large maps and then see you know how did communities change over time? How do they arrange their houses um, compared to each other? Are they arranged in circles? Are they arranged in long linear streets? Um, what does that tell us about the community if they're all kind of focused on a large central area and such? Then how does that community change over time? You can see here that they've built um, large um, palisade fences, these large fences that go around the outside, and then they keep moving it out, right, as the community gets larger and larger and they're um, shifting those walls. So we can try pull those bits of evidence together to look at that. Again, an example from the Townsend site just here in um, Blunt County, really close by. Again, you know, what are these structures? These small corn cribs where they're um, storing corn next to their structures and these large palisades um, that have, you know, large storage features in them too. We also, you know, not just those stains from the features of what they were constructing um, there, but we also get the tools and materials that they were using, the artifacts, right? Stone preserves great, preserves for millions of years, right? So we get lots of stone tools and the chips from those um, from when they're fashioning them uh, and other, you know, some really nicely made ones, but also ones that were used relatively quickly, made quickly, used quickly, thrown away quickly. Um, we also get um, uh, soapstone bowls, especially around 4,000 to 3,000 years here in East Tennessee. Those preserve great. Ceramics, people don't start using them, making them and using them here in Tennessee until around 3000 years ago. So before that, we're stuck with mostly stone tools. But after that, we start seeing ceramics, um, then making ceramics. But those really early ones, we have pretty acidic soils here in the Eastern US. And so those also break down over time. So we often have really small pieces. Uh, we don't often have big ones or enough to make those to reconstruct them, but we can kind of get an idea of what they look like, you know, with if they're smaller bowls, if they're larger pots, um, by some of the fragments, some of the larger fragments we get, and then how the decoration changes through time, too. Plants. That's what I study. I study plant remains. Um, and those preserve great if they're burned. If they're not burned, they decay super quickly, right? You know, your leaves decompose in your yard um, over a season or two. Same thing with any plants. But if they're burned, if they're turned into charcoal, nothing eats it. They don't get any energy from it, which is great for me. Um, so we have really good preservation of plants. Um, so some corn cobs here, especially things that people throw away. These are some really large persimmons. You can even see like some of the persimmon seeds in there, which is super, I get really excited about these kinds of things and some persimmons, whole persimmon seeds here. But we don't get everything that they ate, right? There are some things like if you threw a pile of spinach into a fire and to, for it to be carbonized, it's just not going to happen, right? It's going to burn up completely. Um, so if, if it's not burned, it's going to decay and we're just never going to see it. If people eat it uh, and they digest it, we might get really lucky and get some coprolites or paleo feces. That's a old preserved poop, but otherwise um, we're just not going to, we're not going to see those, uh, what they were actually eating. So the things that they're throwing away, like nutshell and corn cobs and things like that, those, those we have a much like, much more likely to see than things that they're actually eating, like the corn kernels or beans and things like that themselves. And again, they have to fall in the fire. They have to fall just close enough so that they don't burn completely to ash. If they fall in the middle of the fire and burn to ash, we have nothing left. 
but uh, and they can't be too far outside of the fire where they don't burn and um, carbonize and turn into charcoal because then they'll decay. So we have that sweet spot there and hopefully where people are um, some messy cooks where they might spill some things into the fire where we can um, catch some of those um, rarer things that we might not otherwise see. We also collect them. Some of these are super, super tiny, right? You can't see it while you're excavating those little tiny seeds. So we put them, we take advantage of the fact that plant remains are lighter than water. We throw a bucket of dirt into a bucket of water. Theoretically, those plants float to the top here and we collect them in a fine screen and then dry them and look at them under a microscope to identify them. Animal bone, also if we're really lucky, these are even more difficult because again, our acidic soils and all the moisture in them, bone does really terrible. Anything over around 3000 years old, really, really hard to find. So those animal bones that are really dense, like your mammals, especially your larger mammals, deer, do really well. Turtles, but some of these bigger ones, we find a good amount of turtle bones. Uh, birds, look at these teeny tiny little bones. They, they, um, they, what do you call it? Decompose very, decay very quickly in the soil. We just don't get them very often unless they're really big turkey bones. Those wild turkeys we find a good amount of. Uh, fish also. They're so, so tiny. And so, uh, and again, the way that we collect them as archaeologists too, we have to get them from those flotation samples usually, and we're not seeing them as we're digging. We screen to get all of that material out. Um, so those are the main categories of things that we um, look at, especially here in the Eastern US for pre-contact, you know, um, prior to European colonization for those kinds of sites. So five from about 1500 AD and earlier, back to around 12,000 to 14,000 years ago. But we are also using new techniques to, to, to get more information from sites. Things like remote sensing, like using ground penetrating radar, where you're sending basically a radio signal into the ground and it bounces off anything that it sees under there. So we can use those to map out entire villages and towns without even having to dig anything, which is great because as we dig, we destroy it. You can't go back and do it again. You dig it once and that's your only shot. So we take a lot of photographs and uh, a lot of notes as we go along with that. We're also starting to use things like residue analysis uh, where you scrape the inside of the pot and you send it off to an organic chemist and they tell you what kind of fats and lipids and, and such are in there uh, or item um, materials that are associated with beeswax. So you can say, okay, was it, were some of these vessels used for um, holding olive oil or uh, wine or beeswax uh, and, and things like that. That's usually old world here in the Eastern US. Um, it's something that's really just starting to be used uh, here. Um, isotope analysis, looking especially at things like um, carbon, um, some of the heavier carbon isotopes and nitrogen isotopes, those vary depending on the type of plant uh, and also the level in the food chain that the animals are. So the higher up the food chain you go, the, the uh, higher your and your nitrogen um, heavy nitrogen value is so we can take um, pieces of animal bone or human bone and say what were these um, animals and people eating uh, we also look at microsoil analyses we don't just dig the dirt we're interested in that dirt itself and how it got there was it where did people bring it in on their feet like at dust cave were they pulling in that clay from somewhere else um, what, are those layers really ash or are they um, something coming in from the limestone cave? Are there a lot of floods? You can see that looking at the microstructure of the soil itself. So um, we're looking at those things really, really closely. Um, also, um, microbotanical remains, really, really small ones. The things that I'm looking at are larger. Uh, you can see them with the naked eye, but there's also smaller ones like pollen or phytolis. These are little um, silica bodies that help give some of the cells and some plants their shape. So you can tell what kind of plants were in an area and they're, they're silica. So they preserve beautifully just like other stone does. So they, they don't go away over time. Um, so we're looking for those kinds of things. Starch grains, again, um, on the insides of um, pots and um, food artifacts. Um, plates and, and things like that are on stone tools to see what kind of starchy materials they were cooking or grinding in, in those different artifacts. And also looking at the edges of the tools, the stone tools themselves to see how they were using them, what kind of polish is on the edge. You can tell if it was being used to cut bone, to cut meat, to cut wood. Uh, it's amazing some of the stuff that they can do. 
Also, you have an ancient DNA analysis, especially if you use gloves to pick up these and collect the different tools. They can, um, they're um, sampling the edges of them to see what kind of animal they were used to hunt or um, the hide to scrape or the meat to cut. So a lot of those new kinds of techniques. So to just to give you a little bit about some of the research that I'm interested here in, I'm looking at the, I'm really interested in the foraging farming transition here in the Tennessee area. Around 4,000 years ago, people were growing and cultivating plants. Um, so they were starting to farm, um, but enough that they had already domesticated several plants, like this one called sumpweed, which is related to sunflower. They also domesticated sunflower. Tennessee has uh, the oldest domesticated sunflower seed from one of our archaeological sites, which is really exciting for a plant person like me. Um, but their life ways also change, right, as they go from mostly hunting to starting to farm in these different areas. But there's a lag in that. So around 4,000 years ago, they also, said, you know, the same time that they're doing this cultivation, they start using stone pottery, these soapstone vessels. But around 3,000 years ago, they start making these ceramic ones. Why such a long lag? It's also not until around 3,000 years ago that we start to see a lot of post holes that suggest that they're making more substantial structures and staying in one place for a much longer time. So I'm uh, putting together a research project to try to look at a lot of this, to look at the starch grains that are on the inside of those soapstone vessels, as well as the inside of those ceramic pots. What are they cooking in them? Are they cooking the same thing or does that change? Also, um, you know, in this, here's an example of looking at some of those residues, um, uh, pulling off the inside of it. Also going and taking pores at some of these, soil cores at some of these sites, again, to look at those soils really uh, in detail and see, are, is there a lot of flooding in, in this a thousand year time span? or not? What does the environment look like? Is it changing quite a bit? And is that why we see uh, this shift in how they're living? We can also look at pollen and phytolis that are in those soils through time and see, okay, what is that local environment? What kind of plants and trees were growing there? And is that also changing and in flux in this thousand year period? So those are some of the big things that I'm looking at, again, to try to look at and pull together these really rich pictures of how people were living and how that changed from 4,000 years ago to around 3,000 years ago. And I'm gonna go ahead and shift it over then to Giovanna so she can tell you about some of her research and the pictures that she pulls together with forensics. Thanks, Candy. I'll stop my share. All right, so what's really exciting about this is that a lot of the techniques that Candy mentioned, isotopes, DNA, pollen, can all also be used in sort of a more recent way in a forensic context. And so think about the word forensic. We hear it every day. What does the word forensic mean? When we say forensic science, what exactly are we talking about? So think about that for a little bit, maybe come up with a definition, and it's very broad. But the way we usually think about forensic something is that we are applying scientific knowledge to a legal situation, something like a death investigation or a lawsuit. It has to really pertain to a legal situation. So a few years ago, I heard of a show, I think it was called like Forensic Vampire Hunters. And I was like, well, what's forensic about that? And so, you know, but it is like that sexy word, um, but it really has to do with something that pertains to a legal situation. And a um, couple of different forensic sciences. And so again, think about, you know, forensic science is very broad. And so when people say, you know, I am interested in forensic science, I always want to dig a little bit deeper. What do you mean by that? What part of forensic science? So again, thinking about in what context have you heard about forensic something? What's the next word after that? And so even thinking about some of the examples that Candy had. So for example, forensic DNA analysis, right? So that's using DNA analysis to either help identify somebody or link someone to, for example, a crime scene with some DNA um, taken from the scene. 
Whereas, you know, Candy mentioned using ancient DNA and a lot of the techniques are the same, but it's just putting them in a different context. She also talked about pollen. So forensic palynology, which is part of looking at where is pollen coming from, right? And so if you see pollen at the bottom of a sus suspect's shoe, maybe that will indicate where they came from or forensic botany by looking at the roots and how old a plant is, it might indicate how long a body has been buried there. I don't know if any of you watched the show Bones from a while ago. Um, I think one of the people there was a forensic botanist and he was able to collect uh, evidence from a crime scene and say, all right, well, that person was within this like one square mile radius. Obviously, th there's not a ton of, you know, there's a little bit of truth to that. But that's, again, applying botany to a legal situation. Same with forensic toxicology or chemistry. You might be interested in chemistry in one context, but you could also use it in terms of using that forensic to toxicology to see um, what people ingested um, with medicines or other things before they died. And of course, forensic entomology. I have um, a friend who works at UT. She's an entomologist, but what she looks at is diseases that are spread through uh, mosquitoes. So she's not a forensic entomologist, but she is an entomologist. A forensic entomologist is probably more interested in looking at, um, you know, those little fly babies, the maggots and their life cycle uh, to see how long a person's been deceased. So those are different types of forensic science. What I do is forensic anthropology. So it's just taking those biological anthropology principles, you know, the principles that deal with skeletal remains and applying them to a legal situation. And generally we are called in when human remains are skeletal or decomposed, um, or in other words, they're not really visually identified. And I do want to say now that there will be some pictures of skeletal, human skeletal remains in this presentation. Um, but not from a crime scene or anything like that. They're from our donated collection. So when might you need a forensic anthropologist? Well, we can work when remains are skeletal, but also if they're burnt or cremated. So thinking about situations such as some, a train crash or an airplane crash, um, when they're incomplete or fragmentary or decomposed. So even in situations where there's mass burials, that image on the bottom, uh, the bottom picture is from a mass grave in the ex-Yugoslavia. So there's lots of situations in which we can find ourselves. Most of what we do here in Tennessee is work with um, law enforcement to either help search and recover skeletal remains, or they're from forensic cases that are um, from Kentucky or West Virginia or the area. So for example, skeletal remains, um, you know, if they're found uh, somewhere um, in the woods, for example, then we can help um, with that case. And what exactly do we do? A big part of what we do is help with skeletal identification. So help with identification of the individual. So what we try to do is using the skeletal remains is build what we call a biological profile. Um, some of the elements of the biological profile um, include um, biological sex, we can't um, do gender, so we can only do biological sex through the bones. Um, age, and usually these are relatively broad age ranges. Um, how tall they are, their population affinity, their ancestry. And then once we get that, that could help narrow down who the individual is, especially if that information matches with a person who's been reported missing in the area or a couple of people who've been reported missing in the area. And then other information will help us identify them further. Any trauma that the individual might have, or any uh, evidence of disease or pathology on their bones. For example, some of the pathologies that we might see could be some anti-mortem trauma, some trauma before death, 
where it's also been healed. So that middle picture is um, two pictures of is the lower legs. So it is the left and right lower legs. And you can see they don't quite line up right. They don't quite look straight. Um, so those are two fractures, the fracture right about mid shin that occurred before the individual died, long before the individual died. They're very well healed. Um, now that information might also help identify someone. If you, you know, are looking for a missing person and there is a medical record of an individual who broke their both lower legs at some point earlier in their life, then this can help identify them. Um, surgical implants, um, that picture on the left, you can see there's a silver kind of plate right at the bottom. That's one of your lower arm bones. And again, probably an earlier fracture in which a metal plate had to be put in. And so again, that could also be used to help identify. Uh, or surgery. Um, the picture on the right is a cranium and that individual had had some brain surgery. So you can see that some a part of the skull was removed and then put back um, as part of brain surgery. So all of these features, in addition to having an estimate of what their sex or age or height was, could help with identification. So this was um, a case in which um, a, my colleague worked on in which there were healed fractures on the left ribs. Um, and you can see this is a little bit of a lump right there. Um, and it's not quite lined up. And there were fractures from left ribs five to 11. And using the radiographs, these are after death radiographs, and these are before death while the individual was still living. She compared these radiographs, compared where the pathology was, and combined with the biological profile, they were able to make a positive identification. And so those are some of the things that we work on. But of course, before we can help with the identification, we have to find and recover the body. And so part of what we do is forensic archaeology. Archaeology, like Candy's been talking about, can also be ex extended into the forensic world. Um, and my background in archaeology, working as an archaeologist for a few years, has really helped me um, in forensic anthropology. Um, so the goal is really, when we go out with law enforcement, is uh, locate and recover the individual. It is both the location and the recovery are very slow processes. And that's because we are trying to go from here, and you see this is just, it's a hole, and it looks like some dirt's been dug out, and we have to take all that dirt out. Something that, is, that looks like this, and it's a little bit more clear. Again, this is not a crime scene, this is a stage scene for training. So, you know, going to something that looks like this. And once we have that, we also have to map it. We also have to screen all the dirt. And there was a picture, I think, of Candy maybe doing some water screening, which is very nice. Uh, most of what we end up doing, this is called a screen. And just like pushing the dirt through some chicken wire, basically, so that you don't miss any of the small elements or any evidence. Um, and so, you can see, you can imagine how long it took just to get that small mound of dirt. So there is a lot of screening. Um, there's a lot of bending and digging, um, but also a lot of documentation. You want to be able to document what you saw and how you saw the remains when you got them. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about documentation because documentation is something that can be, again, extended not only into archeology span or forensic anthropology, but crime scene analysts always have to document a crime scene when they arrive, right? Or any other feature, any other um, ge geology, you have to document there. A lot of different kind of um, subjects require mapping. So um, I focus on sort of four different kinds of mapping. This is a hand-drawn map, I know. Wow, it's great. Um, <laughs> I am not an artist, <laughs> but you get an idea of sort of how the body is. Um, and this is done with, you know, rulers, pencil, and a piece of paper. And uh, 
Something like this is obviously not very expensive. Um, it take my colleague and I, the two of us, we did many of these. It was always 90 minutes to get a map done. Um, so we were, but we were pretty efficient. Um, obviously the other one is photographs. Photographs are um, pretty easy to take. And this is actually, if you look at the 2D map, this is the same burial. So this is the, the or not the 2D, the hand-drawn map. And there's the photograph. Um, photographs, cameras vary in how expensive they are, but it only takes maybe 10 minutes to take a photograph and there's not a lot of post-processing afterwards. So photographs are very efficient. Another way we document scenes is using what's called a total station. That's very, it takes the same information as a hand-drawn map. It takes, you know, the, the, the relationship between the various elements and their depth, um, but using this machine that's called a total station and can create images uh, like that. This is like two hours in the field, two hours in the lab, and about $15,000. So now we're moving up in expense. Uh, so I like my pencil and paper. I think I can get that kind of information out. And then there's also 3D maps. Um, so uh, these are 3D images that allow this fly through kind of um, experience. This is still the same burial. And so um, this gives you a little bit more information maybe about how deep the burial is. Um, and you'll see some numbers pop up and that's just the relationship, those are measurements, um, basically the distance between certain elements. Um, and I didn't do this. Uh, we had a colleague from NCIS, just like the show, but not um, come and do these uh, 3D scans for us. And it was, um, it was a lot of fun. So this, the 3D scans, again, the machine is very expensive. A lot of, you have to put in about 36 hours of training on how to do it. And then the post-processing is incredibly expensive. And why do I keep saying this? Why, you know, why am I interested in this? And this is because I wanted to see what documentation method would be the most useful for our law enforcement um, colleagues. So what, you have these four documentation methods and we, did with, we used all four for eight outdoor and four indoor scenes. And so using all of these documentation methods, we then deployed a survey to law enforcement and potential jurors to see how they interpreted the crime scene based on these documentation, using these documentation um, scenes that they were presented with. So each image had five corresponding questions. For example, how many individuals do you see? Um, what kind of evidence do you see? How deep is it? If it's a burial and how is the body placed? And, I, and we knew the right answer because we had done these. And so then we also calculated an accuracy score. So based on their survey answers, um, you know, for example, they correctly noted the victims, the victim, the, the research uh, position, the associated evidence and location, they would receive a higher accuracy score. And this is important because ideally, when you are presenting evidence to a jury, you want it to be accurate and you want to know that they interpreted the evidence correctly. So we asked them what was their preferred documentation method. We surveyed over 200 people. And by far, they all said the 3D method was their favorite, not surprising. Only 2.5 liked the hand drawn. I think they were all archaeologists, so <laughs> we're all a little biased. Um, and their second favorite by far was photos. Um, everybody, you know, were like my favorite, my second favorite after 3D, if 3D was their first, would have been the photos. But then what came to accurate, when it came to the accuracy scores, you can see this is for photos. Um, most people um, got over 80% of what they were looking at correct. So when we asked the questions, how many individuals do you see? How are they placed in the burials? Things like that. Over, um, most of them were over 80% accurate. When 
with the 3D scores, uh, not a C, I would say. <laughs> so not great. Um, and this is important because now we can say to agencies that are looking to purchase equipment, they can see this and say, okay, well, we don't have the equipment, we don't have the funds for a 3D scanner. And a lot of times there might be two 3D scanners in the state that have to be shared among agencies, but this is telling them, listen, photos are great. Photos um, depict the evidence just as well. Jurors can understand it and they prefer it. I mean, perhaps after 3D. So these are the kinds of ways in which anthropologists can also contribute to um, you know, sort of budgetary <laughs> decisions that our um, colleagues in the state are, are making. So that is, um, so that was one of the research projects that I was involved in that might have a little impact on, um, on our state. So um, we now want to play a game that's called Good Science or Good TV. I think you can all appreciate that there are a lot of shows on TV that Bones, CSI, Relic Hunter, that depict what we do. And maybe it's accurate, maybe it's not. <laughs> so we thought we would address some of these. All right, this is CSI. It looks like there's just a lot of people standing around. But what they're doing is called a line search, which they're looking on the ground to look for ev any evidence. Is this something that we really do? It actually is. So CSI for the win. Oh, it looks like this individual is licking evidence. Do you all think that this is something we do, lick evidence? I think he's actually trying to see if it's bone or not. I will tell you, that's a fail. <laughs> Candy. Although I did point out to Giovanna <laughs> that archaeologists do, <laughs> we do lick them. You, it's sometimes, you can't tell it's really dirty <laughs> or, or it looks kind of funny, but mm -hmm. bone will stick to your tongue because it's got those little tiny holes in it. Ceramics also will stick to your tongue because well, low fired ceramics like we see here because there's a, so many little tiny holes in them. Um, so sometimes you feel like, is that a rock? Is it a <laughs> bone? Stick it oh, to your um, Okay. So for the next one, there's not as many archaeology television <laughs> shows out there. It's really kind of hard. So this one is from Time Team, um, which used to be on PBS a while ago. So for you younger members out there, um, they would go around and um, help at different archaeological sites and such. So pretty obvious here. I hope that um, time team is a win. <laughs> we do, you know, uh, grid out our squares and collect our data and information um, by unit. Um, you know, very, very nice um, straight walls and such, and usually go down um, five to 10 centimeters at a time. We're looking for these um, things that are preserved. This is a preserved ch um, charred post uh, in the field there. So Time team is a really good one to watch. And then Indiana Jones, perhaps again, I was looking for something that everyone would, uh, might um, have some familiarity with. Is this one good science or good TV, good entertainment? Clearly, I hope you know that it's a fail, uh, especially in this scene where Indiana Jones, it is a great movie, where Indiana Jones is just swiping it and taking it away and running. No, we want to know the context. Where is that <laughs> artifact in relation to everything else there? We don't care about just the thing. We want to know how did it get there? What are people doing with it there? We won't be able to know that if they just take it and, and run off with it. We want to know, you know, so we would have mapped it and taken a lot of photographs and stuff for and then, you know, yes, probably left it there for the local community as well. I know. I'm always like, there's no documentation. Where are the notes? Where are the photos? <laughs> Not that. He just takes it. So, um, so, you know, being an anthropologist in real life is, is actually a lot better than TV for so many of the reasons that we have talked about. Um, it 
what archaeologists do is really also get some, and Kenny, you can talk about this more, but like find some information from the past that will help current people re reconnect to their heritage. Yes. Yeah, so for example, um, there are ceramic specialists who've worked, um, especially in like the North Carolina and Tennessee area, who take some of those decorations that are on the outside of pots and talk to um, Cherokee artists today, artisans, uh, so that they can reintroduce a lot of those patterns that we see from a thousand years ago or 500 years ago or 2000 years ago and reincorporate them today into their basketry and pottery making and other artwork. Um, and chefs as well. You know, I look at, you know, some of these plants that you don't see anymore, like the sumpweed seeds or um, some of these other ones, what kind of plants were people using a thousand years ago before Europeans came in? Uh, what animals were they using too? There are different chefs working uh, in all sorts of different native communities, um, coming up with native recipes and native restaurants where you can go and try some of this cuisine, um, and also much healthier cuisine, much healthier food that they're bringing back to their communities too. And a lot of this is also helping, you know, people discover or discover new things about the past and people that no one knew before. Uh, and I think that Candy has given a lot of great examples. For example, that the sunflower, the oldest domesticated sunflower seed is here in Tennessee, if I understood correctly. Yeah. Um, and with skeletal remains, we can follow evolution, which is also very exciting. And so a lot of these, you know, by sharing our passion and sharing our knowledge, we're helping communities. And it could be all, I mean, all communities, you know, as, as the example that Candy gave, the example that I gave with like the mapping and the documentation, it is wonderful that we can, you know, take our knowledge, take our interest in this field and then expand it to our community members. It's also a lot safer than Indiana Jones. I don't, I don't have to run away from, you know, Nazis and things like that. So that's exactly. helpful. Exactly. I agree. So Any questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask um, them quite directly or um, put in the chat, please. So where might you go to set up a site like do you look for maybe it's a bit like maybe you're looking for something and you set up in an area you might know where it is or maybe do you look for a specific quality of dirt how do you go about setting up somewhere yes great great question um it's to some degree a little easy here in east tennessee because it's so mountainy and hilly anywhere flat next to a river you're going to find an archaeological site um and also a lot of people, you know, especially in areas that have been farmed for a really long time, um, as the farmers till or plow their fields, artifacts come up to the surface. So a lot of those folks know that there are sites on their land too. Um, so both of those, you know, talking to local people about what they see where, um, and also just kind of, yeah, having a good idea, a good guess about where things might be. Uh, especially along rivers, they those as the rivers flood and such, the dirt stacks up over time. And so we get nice um, records that go back 4,000, 10,000, 12,000 years here in East Tennessee, right along the rivers. I just want to thank y'all for an outstanding presentation. This was so interesting. And I find it incredibly amazing that both of you identified where you wanted to be in middle school <laughs> I mean uh, that that just really stuck with me that you know, you know both made that comment and um I, I just think it's in, you've done an incredible job of um your with your presentation tonight Thank you so much. I feel really lucky, truthfully. Yes. You know, again, like I want, I thought it would be so cool to be an archaeologist. But then when I went to college, my dad was like, what kind of job is there for an archaeologist? <laughs> you can go into something else that you can actually get a, that you know that there will be a job. And that's why I, and I was going to be an environmental scientist. You know, I took, I double majored. It's like, I'll just do archaeology for fun. And then here I am. 
So you never know. All of you students out there, you never, never know how, how it all, what, what opportunities end up in your lap. And the opportunities yeah. that come. One of the things that you mentioned in your talk, you talked about the Townsend site. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the students on this call are too young to know about the history of what happened there. Could you explain yeah. it? Yes. Um, so here in the United States, you know, laws for archaeology differ by country. And here in the U.S., um, we like our private property. So any sites that are on private property belong to the, the landowner. But whenever there is any, um, or whenever there are any projects that happen on federal property, um, for example, the Tennessee River, because it's controlled by TVA, so that's all federal property along the river, or any projects that involve federal dollars, so any highway construction that involves federal highway dollars, that's what happened out at Townsend. So the roadway that goes through there used to be one lane in each direction. There's a lot of traffic that going through there out to the Smoky Mountain, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. So they widened it to two lanes. When they widened it, uh, before they did that construction, they had to go through and see what archaeological sites are we going to be impacting uh, as we widen this highway. And so that's what triggered it. Uh, and Lo and behold, there's a lot <laughs> along that stretch of the little river there in this really nice flat cove next to a river. And so there was about five kilometers worth of archaeological sites. It took them, they were out there for over a year, excavate like 30 to 50 people, five to seven days a week out there trying to get it all out before, before, before construction of the road. But they found a ton of stuff that goes back, some of it 10,000 years, but the more intensive occupations go from about 4,000 years ago up through historic Cherokee villages, um, you know, that date to around the late 1600s. So fascinating stuff. And we have all that material here at UT, so that it's there for research for folks. There's plenty, plenty to do if any of you students want to come and do research on that stuff. It's here. So they could do a science fair pro uh, project with you? <laughs> it might, if it, it, it would probably take a little bit of time, but we could probably, we might be able to think something up if someone was super interested. Mm -hmm. So if they start at middle school, by the time they're in college, something will happen. <laughs> They'll have completed a dissertation by then. <laughs> right. Um, we can take one more student question and then we're going to wrap up the um this meeting so if any student had a question uh please put it into the chat or unmute yourself and please don't be shy our email addresses are there so um you can email us and you can't if you can't remember who's who and what we talked about just email both of us our offices are right next door so <laughs> we are uh so that would be fine too yes and we're pretty easy to find on the anthropology webpage at ut mm -hmm. so just anthropology.utk.edu Okay, if that wraps up all the questions, um, I'm going to resume um, the screen share real quick so that we can do our raffle. Um, not really raffle, our um, incentive, incentive prize. Where is my... Oh, I can't minimize. Cause... Thanks for all the comments. It was, it was fun to be here. So I've never done a virtual science fair before or science uh, meeting. Well, you can be a regular. <laughs> <laughs> you um, see our, all our students, um, not just virtually always see, but um, we do have opportunities in the spring. And if you would like to be a judge or just like participate in helping out, um, we can always need the help. Um, all right, so a screen. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Vidoli and Dr. Hellenbach for your speech. It was great. I know the students had a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, I was very much entertained about um, the also the 
the fails and the um, and the truth part um, of your presentation because you know there's a lot of things in TV that spruce things up, not really factual. Just um, but there, you know, if it's true, then it's it's even more fun that way. All right, so I did go ahead and pick a winner during this meeting. Um, I just need to double check that you're still here, um, Chris Utiger. If you could unmute um, yourself or say something in the chat, uh, just to confirm that you heard me. <laughs> I see, I see your name, but if you could just confirm you heard. He said that he heard in the Perfect. chat. Um, so go ahead and send an email to prep at utk.edu. I'll need your um, the your first and last name. The uh, prize you would like and also a full address so that we can send over um, your prize to you. Wow, those are some nice prizes. Yes, yes. The mm -hmm. drone um, and the structural engineering kit is very popular. Mm -hmm. All right, again, we are on social media, so go ahead. Um, if you've not already, uh, subscribe to our newsletter or uh, keep tabs on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And again, our next meeting is going to be December 6th at 7 p.m. with our um, graduate mentors. So if you would like to register for that next meeting, go ahead and do that. And then that is the end of our meeting. Um, if you have anything else you want to say, go ahead and say that. If not, you guys have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Trixie, for uh, reaching out to us. Of course. Mm -hmm. really yeah, we were very happy to have you come and do this. This was really good. It was excellent. It was so fun. Oh, and, good. And informative. <laughs> I mean, it was fun, mm -hmm. but also very interesting. And we record it, so you don't know. Some of the some of them are going to go back and tell their friends how cool it was. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll, so. I don't, we don't, do we keep stats on that, tr Trixie? How many times they download? Okay. Oh, not how many times they download, but um, I can see maybe how many times they clicked on it. Okay. Yeah.